even try to remember your name. My wife does. I don't. <laughs> Because even, you know, if, if things were to work out and we moved here, a year from now, I'll still be trying to get your name. I apologize for that, but um, that's just the way it is. I, um, I'm an old Alabama boy, born and raised in the deep rural south. My dad was a preacher. Uh, my mom, the church secretary. And so I grew up in church buildings. I can tell you all the secrets, how to have fun in a church building when you're the preacher's kid. I knew all the hidey places. I knew where the candy was hidden. My own personal jacuzzi in a baptistry that I swam. I brought my swim trucks and swam, you know, every day. And uh, you learn how to pew race. Have you ever heard of pew racing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's where you run on the tops of the pews from back to front. Just don't fall, because that's not good. Uh, but, but yes, I grew up in a church building, and uh, so this is, is almost like a second home to me. And uh, we have been to your building many times before. We, uh, we preached in Burlington, Iowa from 2009 until 2016, somewhere in there. So we came to the area-wide singings every year. Uh, Attended preacher's meetings here with Lance. So I've known Lance since about 2009, 2010, somewhere in there. Uh, we also uh, worked with the Rockford Church of Christ, not too far away. Uh, and so we, uh, we love this area. And uh, I have, uh, the reason I'm trying to get back up into this area, I have a brand new granddaughter. She is about eight months old. I didn't get to meet her until she was about four months old because of this stinking virus that was going around. And I kept telling my daughter, I'm coming up there. She said, no, you're not. She said, unless you quarantine for such and such time and put on your mask. And I said, don't tell me what to do. I'm coming up there. And she said, no, you're not. But finally they said, okay, you can come see her. So we got to go see her. And uh, fell in love immediately. How many of you have grandchildren? Oh, then you know what I'm talking about. That first one. And uh, just fell in love the moment I got to hold her, and I didn't want to give her back for a long time. I just wanted to hold her. And uh, we have many friends and, and family up in, in this area, and so we're excited to be here. My wife is from San Diego. She's a California surfer girl. I'm the old Alabama redneck. How in the world we ended up together, I don't know. Exact and total opposites. Uh, but God blesses that, and, and uh, so we are just so happy uh, that we found each other, that God put us together, and that he's taken us on this trip together. Not this trip, this whole trip, you know, life. And uh, we, what would you like to know? Ask me some questions. Where are you originally from? This jacket. I, I buy all my clothes online. So if it doesn't fit, that's because I don't send them back. I paid for them. I'm just going to keep them. The fit part I'm talking about. Oh, well, I don't know. How long have you been married? Well, 13 years. 13? Yes. How did you meet? Neighbors. We were neighbors, next door neighbors. And my best friend, who is a member of the church in Rockford, owned the apartment building, a fourplex. And uh, we were on the top two. And uh, I could hear her and her boys yelling at each other all day, every day, because the walls were thin. And um, I thought, man, that's some crazy people over there, but <laughs> that side. But my, my buddy uh, went to her one day and said, hey, I've got this friend and he lives right beside you, and he's a nice guy. And he and she turned us all down. Uh, but eventually she came begging, just beg me. <laughs> Please go to the movies with me. And I gave in and went, and it's, it's, it's just been that, you know, ever since. Yes, ma'am. In Alabama. Where in Alabama? The whole state. My dad was a preacher. So I was born in Mobile. I grew up just north of Birmingham. That's where I call home, Walker County. A uh, little, little place. Well, Jasper's the city, but we were a little bitty community called Dilworth. That's where all of my cousins, aunts, uncles, there's a family farm. That's why I call that home. I went to college in Montgomery at Faulkner University. Um, 
Uh, we, my dad worked with IBC, which is now Heritage Christian University up in Florence. He also um, preached at many churches all over the state. Uh, so we, we had a lot of homes. You met. Your wife, contradicting what you're saying about you. Don't Jesus. listen to her. <laughs> What'd she say? <laughs> she just shook her head. <laughs> no, she's always right. How many years have you stayed at different places, and how, what's your projection for here? Different amounts of time at different places. We were seven, was it seven years in Burlington? Uh, about five years in Rockford. Um, it's been various, some were shorter, uh, some longer. Um, preachers never know. We are always, we're, we're longing for that one place that's just the forever home. And I, the reason I like is I know Lance has been here a long time. And I like that. Now, to try to follow, that's pretty big shoes to fill. Uh, no. But <laughs> at the same time, I like that stability. Uh, we don't like moving. We really don't. Um, we also have our children, are, we're empty nesters, except her mom lives with us. My, my dad just passed away back in March, so my mother spends time with us and my sister back and forth. So we have uh, reverse, emptiness. reverse emptiness. I don't know what you call that, but moms. I do. We, we both do. I have one older sister, a younger brother. They're both out in Texas. She has a sister and two brothers. They're out in, well, brothers in California, sister in Minnesota. Wow. Uh, I don't know if you said this at the beginning, but uh, what's your educational background? Way too much. Still owe way too much. Um, I went to Faulkner University for undergrad. I have a bachelor's degree in Bible. Then I went to Lipscomb, got a master's degree in ministry. Uh, then eventually I went to um, Amridge, which is back in Montgomery, Alabama. It used to be uh, Southern Christian, Southern Christian or, or before that was Alabama School of Religion, I think. And I got another master's in marriage and family therapy. Then I went to Newburgh Seminary and got a doctor of ministry. And then I went, uh, worked on a clinical uh, psychology uh, <coughs> education and so way too much <laughs> just yeah you grew up in the church when did you actually decide to become a Christian very early my mom says some of my first words were preacher I wanted to be a preacher <laughs> really? yes. never really wanted to be anything else and how about Karina when Karina uh, became a Christian as an adult uh, her and her mom were baptized, was it the same day? Same, uh, yeah. same day in the Rock River, or mom, Kishwaukee? Not mom, but yeah, okay. in the Rock River. Uh, wow. Yes, yeah. so in Rockford. Had fish floating by. <laughs> <laughs> so all those sins that were washed away, killed all fish. Karina, we'd usually, for years, we took annual canoe trips with the teens up to the Rock River by Dixon, and our secretary, I don't see Brandy, Brandy here. here, she gets baptized every time we go canoeing up there. children how many children we have two each uh, she has two boys we were we were married and then we got divorced and just for those that were not us we were married to other people uh, even by the most conservative standards they were what you would call a scriptural divorce uh, I was a single custodial parent for about a decade um, And uh, she has two boys, uh, one in California, one in Galesburg, not too far from here. He just graduated high school. Uh, I have 
a son and a daughter. My son's in Jacksonville, Florida, probably about to move to Phoenix. He works for Amazon, and uh, he helps set up new facilities whenever they set up a new facility. My daughter lives in Chicago. And uh, so we... We're in Chicago. Downtown. She married a Chicago firefighter. Mary, glad to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you. Um, I actually have been very active with the youth group and gone with them on a lot of trips and such. Are you willing and looking forward to Yes, in fact, we saw, last time I saw Lance was in Gatlinburg at Winterfest. Yep. We were just walking down the street, happened to see each other. Uh, Karina and I were there with, with our kids, and Lance was there with, with your team. Uh, I was a youth minister for several years, and I love. Um, Teenagers. The only thing I'm too old for anymore is lock-ins. I just can't. I can't, I can't, do, the older I can't do the lock-ins anymore. But, but I love uh, taking the teens on trips. I do have one more question. Uh, in a church, usually some people style. I was just wondering, uh, would you think there's more of a style for? Growing a congregation, sustaining a congregation, or what? Growing. Um, I, um, we actually, the two congregations that we worked with near here, Burlington and Rockford, both doubled in size in our tenure while we were with them. Um, in fact, both more than doubled in size. And uh, growth is, I think, is just the vital. If you're not growing, what are you doing? Yeah. What did you attribute that growth to? What God, did you, what did first you do? and foremost. But um, my formula is create a place that is attractive. In other words, some churches, you almost hesitate to bring your friends because of what might be said. Will they like it? Will they, will they never come back? I want to create a place that's attractive, <laughs> that, that you can... You would think, oh, my, my friends would love it here. My family would love it here. Um, that's, that's step number one, which is crucial. But then step two is a bit harder because with growth, your core people start to feel left out. Does that make sense? Four people that have been there and this is their church and they've been here for years and years and years all of a sudden with uh, in fact we did this at Burlington one Sunday just just because we wanted to find out we took a survey how many of you are new well when I first moved there it was a church of about 50 that Sunday we had 150 plus people that have been there their whole lives look around and they think this is not church anymore, which is kind of selfish, right? Because it defeat. I mean, the purpose of the church is to grow and make new disciples into the kingdom, but to do that, you have to realize, and many of these people are not of the tradition, in fact, none of them really are of the same tradition, and so they've got questions. We had a lady, I'll never forget, she could, on Sunday night in Burlington, we had question night, because we had so many new people. And we didn't want it scripted answers. We wanted it off the cuff. So you just drop a question in a box. We pull it out and answer, the, the elders and myself would answer as best we could, just off the cuff. And she said, if restoration is the goal, why do you use Welch's grape juice? So I promptly said, okay, guys, this, this one's yours. <laughs> Because she looked, and she was from um, the, the, the Baptist group that washes feet, very traditional, their acapella. Is that, do uh, you remember, uh, free, not Free Will Baptist? Um, I can't think of, but she grew up in Georgia. Southern Baptist? No, it's not Southern, but I can't think of it right now. But they, they practice, you know, the public washing of feet, they sing acapella. Uh, but apparently they used not Welch's grape juice in their communion. <laughs> so, uh, 
But you deal with things like that because they're not of the same tradition. And when you look at the New Testament church, many Gentiles coming in, what it must have been, that's the rest, after the book of Acts, the whole rest of the New Testament, that's what it's about. How to get Jew and Gentile to get along with each other. Yes. What brought you here? How did you connect with that? I knew Lance. I knew this congregation because I had been here. So I knew the reputation. And... Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. I knew the area. Um, you saw it somewhere online that there was an opening, or? Well, we can go into that later, but yes. Okay. Have you worked at a church without elders? Yes, I have. The, the church in Rockford. Yeah, the church in Rockford did not have elders. Uh, they tried. Didn't last long. It's just different. It's difficult. But yes, um, you do the best you can with what you've got. Um, in fact, this is just my experience. The churches that do have elders in many times appoint men for the wrong reasons to be their shepherds. And so you end up with people... And I don't know anything about the ones here. I'm not, this is not a reflection on this congregation. Just in many of the churches that I've been to in the past, they were successful businessmen, but because they were successful businessmen, they didn't have time for the church. Mm -hmm. So you were last in Rockford, did you say? I'm in Heron, Illinois right now, Heron. which is the Marion Carbondale area. Okay, and why are you feeling like God's leading you away from Actually, uh, I forget now who I talked to on the phone first, but I wasn't looking. I wasn't looking. Uh, but I knew Lance, and I knew the church, and I knew the area, and I thought, boy, you know, if I were going to, I'd, I'd kind of like to be there. So they didn't pick you, Lance? No, no. In fact, <laughs> uh, we, we really aren't looking. We're very happy where we are, but... But sometimes you feel like God is leading. Yes. It's just the, the tug of the heartstrings, I guess. Also, you know, you've known of our congregations. Yes. You know that we're long suffering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, wow. the question is uh, with your style of teaching and preaching, uh, do you intertwine? Uh, more modern methods of uh, uh, videos, uh, uh, slides, uh, PowerPoint, yes, PowerPoint, I use PowerPoint. Uh, I, I usually, my sermons, I usually preach in series format, uh, but they're short, like one month at a time. Uh, but classes tend to be not necessarily per quarter, uh, but longer, more in-depth. Study. I was, I was just wondering uh, if you're pr proficient in using uh, uh, other forms yes. of uh, yes. the, uh, media and yes. stuff. Yes. I try, we try to get uh, all <coughs> learning styles involved. And very open to suggestions. I am not the my way or the highway type personality. I am much more a laid back what works. Let's try it. This is one of those lovely questions okay. that the wives like. Is your wife involved? Yes. She is uh, very involved in my ministry, more so as a support to me than anything. Uh, she does have a job. She works out outside the home from the home. That makes sense. Her home office is in St. Louis, Missouri, but she has to go there once a quarter for two or three days. Uh, other than that, she works from home. We have an office set up. As long as she has an internet connection, she's, she's good to go. She manages hotels, or actually she does the benefits for people who work at hotels all over the country, but mostly in St. Louis. Uh, Midas Hospitality is the company that she works for. She's been with them almost since the beginning, not quite the beginning almost and um, uh, 
she's my sugar mama. She makes more money than me. And I tell her all the time, I'm ready to retire and play golf. She said, okay. <laughs> but, but she does, um, uh, she's not necessarily, for example, a class teacher, uh, but she is a people person. She, she's uh, very much a people person and very encouraging. people in our home. She likes to, she likes to feed. Be careful. <laughs> and by the way, I said we don't have children. We do. We have three little vermin. I call them. They're dogs. And I have one. She has two. And they're old. They're, I don't know how much longer we're at. They're about 15 getting 13 years or so. They're a little chihuahua. Something or others. So mine is getting kind of grouchy. So he doesn't like you. He likes me and he likes, you know, our family. But the other day the water meter reader came in the yard and oh boy, he almost chewed him up and spit him out. He was never like that until just recently. Uh, how, uh, any more questions? Because I'm definitely not going to have time to finish uh, the lesson. But let's go to James chapter 1, if you don't mind. While you're turning there, when I was in the fourth grade, my mother um, told me it was a field trip. <clears throat> she said, you are not going swimming. We were going to a water park. And down in deep rural Alabama, mixed bathing was not allowed. Even though there's no soap involved, you are not allowed. There will be girls in that pool, and you are not getting in. Okay, yes, ma'am. I had my swimsuit on under my jeans. Just in case. So afterwards, we get home off the bus, and I walk in, and my pants are a little wet, you know, around where I have my swimsuit on, and my hair's a little wet, and she said, you went swimming. I said, Mom, I couldn't help it. And she said, you had your swimsuit. I said, well, yeah, just in case I got tempted. <laughs> Didn't work out so well. I couldn't sit down for a little while after that little discussion. There was a little girl that, that uh, was told not to eat the cookies. She had been told, don't touch those cookies. So a little while, Mom comes in and, 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 and finds out she had been into the cookies. Why did you get into those cookies? She said, I was just smelling them and my tooth got caught. <laughs> Mark Antony, silver-tongued orator of Rome. He had it all. I mean, he had good looks. He had uh, talent. He had everything in the world going for him. And one day his, his mentor, his tutor, looked at him and said, Oh, Marcus, oh, colossal child, you could be ruler of the world, but you can't deal with temptation. Well, this morning, for just a few minutes we have left, I want to talk about temptation. Has anyone ever been tempted in here besides me? We all deal with temptation. I, I have about four <coughs> facts for temptation I want you to write down. But, but first, give me a definition of temptation. Your definition. Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Who has a definition of temptation? Have you seen something that... Uh carnal aspect that you want, but the spiritual aspect of you is saying, stay away from that. Yep. One half of you says don't, one half of you says do. Anybody else? That's a good one. Lured, lured or drawn. Lured or drawn towards something that you know you shouldn't. Well, but temptation can be good too. Well, sure. I mean, it might be you want to eat a cucumber or something. 
I found. The act of enticement to do wrong by the promise of pleasure or gain. You're enticed to do wrong by a promise of either pleasure or gaining something. Well, as we talk about this, I don't want you to think just of sensual sins because that's not the only thing we're, we're tempted toward. Name some things like ice cream or cucumbers. <laughs> I'm going this direction, though. <laughs> Name some things we're tempted by. Your friends. Your friends. Your family. Money. Money. Desires. Desires. Power. Say it again. Power. Power. <laughs> to lie. To cheat. To steal. To covet. Ooh, covet. And the wrong thing say the wrong thing or to say too much. Uh, I'm going to give this illustration. I, I, it, I'm just tempted. I, I can't not do it. Can't we went to Las Vegas on our honeymoon. Now you're thinking, uh-oh, this is not that kind of story. My brother happened to be in Las Vegas on a, um, business, trip. a business trip. And so he had some extra, he had lots and lots of miles, air miles. He gave us Certificate, so uh, I think Southwest, so we could get, we could fly free. So we chose Las Vegas, and we stayed in that pyramid. You ever been there? Yep. I don't know what it's called, but anyway, we look sore. Yes, we stayed there. But my brother said, now, "I'm not going to bug you on your honeymoon, but I want to take you out to eat." Okay, we went to I think Caesar's Palace to the buffet. <laughs> now you laugh. It's one hundred dollars a person. Wow. I'm glad he was paying. <laughs> Wife, don't tell. She ate one salad, one bowl, <laughs> one little salad. World's that. most expensive salad. So I have to make up the difference. I went four times to the prime rib station. <laughs> I, had, I don't know how many pounds of crab legs, but here's the deal: they had creme brulee. Oh. Well. I ate 12 of them. Oh. 12 creme brulees. Now they're little, okay? They're little. And I'm, I'm trying to tempt her. I'm trying, just try it. It's just sugar, but better. You ever had creme brulee? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. 12 of them. Now, I couldn't walk out of there. She had to carry me out of this buffet. But the temptation for me, I was rationalizing she didn't eat. So I've got to. Now, what was my sin? Probably gluttony. Yeah. <laughs> Stupidity. <laughs> oh my. I mean, it, it was just unreal. But so many different things tempt us. So I want you to write these four things down. Number one, and we're in James chapter 1, beginning with verse 13. Four facts about temptation. Number one, temptation is inevitable. Look at verse 13. If you've got your Bibles open. When tempted, no one should say, okay, hold on, because we've already hit it. What was the first word? When. when. It didn't when. say if. 13. It said when you are tempted, so it's inevitable. It's going to happen. I mean, if you reach a certain age, it is going to happen, right? When you are tempted... It would be wonderful if we could live life without facing temptation, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great? And maybe even you decide there is a place I can go and I'm never tempted there. You know what my advice is to you? Don't go, because as soon as you're there, you're going to be tempted. Maybe you decide, I've got this Christian secret, this victory secret. Don't give in to it, because as soon as you do, you're going to be tempted. Because temptation is inevitable. It is coming. It is going to be there. If you're a monk living in a monastery, will you be tempted? Yes. If you are a preacher preaching in the pulpit, will you be tempted? Yes. <laughs> My dad went to Africa as a missionary. Uh, just like a two, three-week trip. And he said, it's the hardest thing in the world to preach, and the ladies don't have tops on 
It was just out in the jungle. He said they gathered and they just didn't. They didn't have the tops on. And he said that's a hard. That's, that's just very distracting. <laughs> Preacher in a pulpit can be tempted. Uh, how about a housewife here in Moline? Can she be tempted? Sure. How about a college student? Yes. A Bible professor. It doesn't matter who you are. You will be tempted at some point in time. And, and, and understand, James has just talked about trials. Remember that passage? Consider it all joy when you face various trials. It's no accident he's talking about temptation after he talks about trials. Because Satan knows that's when you're weakest. That's probably, is a pandemic a trial? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody face temptations after or during the pandemic? I just read 30% of churches are closing because of the pandemic. 30%. Just in, in Heron, actually it's in Marin, Marion, there is a church that just put up a sign outside with, for sale. Why? Is it just like a restaurant? You didn't get enough business? Well, it's probably a lot of things. Satan knows what he's doing. And if he can close up some churches, he's going to do it. And it's happening all over. Think of the Israelites wandering around in the desert. Were they tempted? <coughs> yes, they were. Did they just go through some trials? Absolutely. So it is going to happen. Well, for time's sake, you're getting a condensed version. Number two, use the right resistance. Do you use the same medicine for everything that goes wrong with you? I struggle with migraines. Can I take my cholesterol medication to fix my migraine? Uh, you got an ingrown toenail. Would you use blood pressure medication to deal with your ingrown toenail? No. You've got to use the right medicine, the right resistance for various temptations. Um, if you are tempted by... Let's say God to gossip. Anybody ever been tempted to gossip? What's the right resistance for gossip? Zip it. Zip it. That's the only, the only resistance for gossip, isn't it? You can't just kind of say, oh, well, maybe I can talk to you know, gossip over here when I'm not at church, but you can't. No, there's only one resistance for gossip. You don't need a bit in your mouth. You need a muzzle. Muzzle it. That's the only answer for gossip, right? So don't deal with other stuff. Just stop talking about them. Just, just stop. Use the right resistance. If, if, um, if you're tempted by laziness, what should you do? Get moving. <laughs> just get, get to work. If you're tempted by bitterness, what should you do? Forgive. If you're holding back and not giving the Lord what is His, what should you do? Give. It's, it really is not that difficult. But we try to make it difficult. Use the right resistance, the right medicine for the temptation that is bothering you. That one is number two. Number three, temptation is an individual matter. But each one is tempted when, what does it say? When. Drawn away by his own desire. You are drawn away by your own evil desire. Mm -hmm. I want you to circle two words in there. First, each one. Each one is tempted by his own, circle own, evil desire. Does what temp, uh, uh, let me figure out how to say this. Does what tempts me also tempt you? No. Not necessarily. Because I tried my best to get her to eat creme brulee. <laughs> she didn't want to have anything to do with it. But if you're tempted by, oh, we were talking to a friend just the other night. And he said, 
cocaine gives me such a rush, and it gives it just makes me feel alive. You know what? I don't have the slightest temptation to get this little white powder and sniff it up my nose. I just don't. It does not tempt me at all. I don't want it. It's an individual thing. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Question, where does temptation come from? Did I hear the devil? That's a good answer. But I'm not sure it's exactly right. From within. Within. Each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, it comes from inside you. We might expect James to say it comes from Satan. It's not what he says. He says the source of temptation is your own evil desire. He puts the blame squarely on us as individuals. Satan knows what he's doing. Yes, he does. And I'm convinced he has a role to play. But the point is, I can't say the devil made me do it. Right? I can't say that. He didn't make me do it. It came from inside me. I made a choice. I made a choice. I was tempted. I saw it. And I made a choice to bite that bait. It's a fishing. Modern day fishing. I'm not sure they use you know, hooks and all. They probably use more nets instead of one. They weren't satisfied with one. They wanted a whole bunch. We send out you know, a single hook. When, when we choose to yield to temptation, we're going to talk about the process in just a moment, time permitting. I only have about five minutes left. But nothing outside ourselves is strong enough to make us sin. Not even Satan. Nothing is that strong. You sin because of what's going on inside of you, inside your heart, inside your mind, your thought process. Number four. Temptation follows the same pattern. And he tells us what the pattern is. Verse 14 begins the process. Verse 15 carries it out. Step one, the bait is dropped. We're going to use the fishing illustration. You're this nice little fish underneath the water, and you see, whoop, here comes a, a, a little worm on a hook. Have you sinned yet? Not yet. Not a sin to see it. You couldn't help that. You were just there, and all of a sudden it dropped right down in front of you. That's not the sin. Step two, inner desire is attracted to the bait. Have you sinned yet? No, it's not a sin to be tempted. Hebrews 4.15. Yes, Hebrews 4 and verse 15. It's not a sin to be tempted. I haven't sinned yet. I saw I was just kind of minding my own business. The worm dropped right in front of me. I was attracted to it because, well, it's not a temptation if you're not attracted to it, right? Mm -hmm. When does it become a sin? When you act on it, when you take the bait, when you choose, deep down inside, I have just made a conscious choice. I'll have another creme brulee. No, that's not right, because I wasn't even hungry at that point. <laughs> I was just gluttonous. <clears throat> step three, sin occurs when you bite the bait. And step four, tragic consequences. Where did that fish end up? Dead. Inside a frying pan. That's where it ended up. Each one is tempted... When by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The trap was baited. You saw it. 
tempted, you had a choice. Take it or leave it. How does that tie in with free will? Well, it's all about free will, really, because you have the choice. Take it or leave it. It's a conscious decision. Now, it may happen super fast, but it was still a conscious decision. You can pass that temptation one day and the next day fail it. That's right. Yeah. Yes, you can. Because yeah. if I went, well, we went last night and they had creme brulee. I noticed they had creme brulee on the dessert. <laughs> I said, no, I learned my lesson. That doesn't mean I never ate it again. I did. Dragged away. What does that sound like? Force. It sounds like force, but it's not really. It's just you were tempted. You, the, the bait was there. Now, you might be dragged away after you bit. You know, the, the fish tries to get off the line. But it's dragged away. exactly the way temptation works with us. It's dropped. It looks good to us. It appeals to us. We have interest in it because Satan knows what he's doing. And we have a choice, bite or not to bite. That is the question. I want you to go to Genesis 39. Let's look at a classic example. You know it well. Genesis 39, Joseph and Potiphar's house. First 12 verses. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Genesis 39. Time is just about up, so bear with me here. Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He hasn't sinned yet, right? He hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, everything he's done is, is good and well and right, and God is blessing him tremendously. It even says he was handsome in appearance and form. Now, Mrs. Potiphar noticed him. And there's nothing subtle about Mrs. Potiphar. The bait is dropped. We read this and it makes it sound like, ah, it's no big deal. But we know better, don't we? Mm -hmm. The bait is dropped. It is of interest. If it weren't of interest, it wouldn't be a temptation. It's not like Satan messed up, didn't know his job. Satan knew his job well. But Joseph made a better choice, the right choice. He saw it and he chose, I'm not biting. I don't want that bait. It looks good. I kind of want it. Half of me wants it. But the other half knows better. Someone trusts me. I don't want to mess that up. I want to ruin that. So he made a better choice. I'm going to close with this story. When I was in high school, had a guy that was a religious fanatic. 
It wasn't me. That's not to my glory. That's to my shame. We had a, a friend of mine. He was a religious fanatic. Didn't go to our church. He went to another church. We were on a... Uh, uh, boy, it seems like all my stories end up in field trips, because that's the only thing I remember about school. <laughs> but we were, we were on a band trip. I was in the band. And the girls were going to play it. A, a mean trick on this kid because he was a religious fanatic knew it he carried his bible everywhere he talked about church he invited you to church it, he was the kind of guy he would say i don't have any money today will you loan me a dollar i'll bring you two tomorrow and he would the girls invited him into their room some of them and one of them was just getting out of the shower and they said well, I'm gonna, we're just going to flash him and see what happens she had a towel wrapped around her. She opened it up. You know what he did? Exactly what Joseph did. He turned and ran. Now that became, he became the laughing stock of the school, basically. But he made the right choice. Now, did he get his reward right then and there? Well, sort of, kind of, but not. I mean, he at school, people laughed at him for days, weeks, months, years. I don't know. That was our senior year, so it eventually ended, but he got his reward, I'm convinced. Now, I haven't kept up with him, so I don't know what happened to him in life. But I, he, he, he taught me a lesson I will never forget. Because if I were in that situation, I'm not sure what I would have done. Now, everybody knew me as the preacher's kid, and everybody knew I was going to be a preacher. I didn't hide it. But I didn't carry my Bible everywhere. And I wasn't always talking about the Bible and inviting people to church. I tried to be a normal, quote, normal kid. He taught me a lesson. There's, there's a way you treat temptation. You don't tolerate it. Counteract it. Any final thoughts? I just had a question. Could you say your definition again? Yes. The, let me find it. The act of enticement to do wrong by the promise of pleasure or gain. Thank you for coming to class. Thank you for inviting us. We have enjoyed it so far. We look forward to worshiping with you in just a few moments. And uh, look forward to giving you a lesson from Judges chapter 5. It's more of an Old Testament lesson. Going to meet our history buffs. Hopefully keep his interest. And uh, I look forward to it. So we'll, we'll see you in the auditorium in just a few minutes.